Good morning, everyone. Happy to see that it seems that you are all back with us today <laughs> for a new session with very interesting topic. So the, 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 the first topic of the day is one of my favorite topics in the context of the project, sharing the airspace. No airspace for us, no GA. And this is something we need to consider very, very closely. I had the opportunity to, to, to quickly review a, a small booklet prepared by FAI yesterday, which is especially addressing this issue. So we have very interesting people around the table, and I will leave uh, Vladimir, my, my colleague, in charge of the moderation, introduce all the, the panelists. But I would like to make a special introduction for, for Guillaume. Guillaume Ferral is with us today. Very pleased that he is here. We've been working together hard these last weeks because he's preparing a world tour. A world tour with another colleague with two small airplanes, two small LSA CTLS. Of course, they had to modify the aircraft because they are flying over the ocean, over the Pacific. Uh, so they need a lot of fuel on board. So we, we had to work on flight condition, permit to fly, in cooperation with the FOCAT. Thank you, Paolo, for your, for your support. I don't see you, but I know. Thank you. I believe it was great support from FOCAT to help us to approve this very special configuration so, Guillaume, just for you, and to wish you good luck for this tour. <laughs> I will keep an eye on the internet every day to follow their flight. <laughs> <laughs> Vladimir, have the floor. Good luck. Dominic, thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Very good morning. I think it will be an exciting start of uh, the discussions today. We have three interesting panel, and the first one is about the sharing of airspace. And uh, uh, when I came into, uh, when I was uh, notified, uh, I was told that uh, I should take over this panel, I, I really uh, thought it will be a very interesting one. In the course of discussions we've had over the internet and uh, last night, last, uh, last evening, we, I have understood that there is a lot of uh, concern in, in the room about the airspace, how it will be organized in future, and uh, where are the threats, and uh, how we can integrate all of that so that GA can prosper and uh, uh, go uh, further in, in, in uh, aviation. Uh, you see uh, the first slide actually shows the complexity. I, th I hope everyone in the room can find your uh, way of flying on the, on the picture. There is everything from the old uh, way of flying uh, without the engine to most innovative ways of flying uh, uh, and, uh, airplanes or air vehicles which are uh, vertically taking off and then uh, flying uh, 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 without uh, any input of the pilot because the pilot is actually the operator. But we have the airlines there, we have the military stakeholders who need airspace for their mission. So it's very complex. And it has been always very challenging. I'm proud that panel composition actually represents a good uh, uh, spectrum of aviation stakeholders. Uh, uh, even uh, many, or if not all of them, have a GA background. So that's a very good combination because to my view, they have a good understanding of complexity and variability we are facing in the GA uh, com community. Uh, in in uh, terms of uh, uh, panel introduction, I will do it uh, one by one when people will be presenting their, their pieces, their, their input. And uh, I will start with the first one. Okay, so uh, one last question. Uh, before we... Uh, uh, before we uh, started, I phrased uh, three questions to the panelists, and they will be answering or uh, making input to, to, to this uh, along these throws, uh, three questions. So, uh, what are the three biggest problems uh, according to their perception? What is the vision for aviation in 2030, and how to get there? How to how to 
uh, embrace how to visualize the vision. The first panelist, I'm pleasure to introduce Yanni uh, Hotola. He is Finnish. He comes from the authority, the Trafi, so our partners in Finland. And uh, Yanni is a, a passionate and active GA pilot. He was involved in many interesting uh, GA developments in Finland, and uh, most recently he's involved in uh, introduction and also incorporation of drones into the airspace. And I think he has a, an interesting message to pass to you. Yanni, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, and good morning from my, my, uh, my part also. <clears throat> Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to warn all of you that be nice to Dominique Roland because if you're not, he makes you be one of these panel members. A <laughs> uh, lot of probably bits oversold me as far as the drone expertise goes, but I've been uh, following that also in my role as a general aviation coordinator in Finland. Uh, my presentation will be short and scary. Uh, and in a general level, uh, my colleagues over here will offer the detail and comfort after that. So, what is the biggest uh, problem relating to sharing the airspace today and the future? Uh, in my opinion, the biggest traditional threat of GA that has been the uh, urban development and uh, that uh, encro encroaching into the uh, airdromes and airports that we've been used has been replaced by the existential threat of drones to the uh, GA's access to the airspace. We've been used to uh, commercial air transport running over us in every possible way, but that has been limited into certain locations and the technical uh, details will keep the airspace requirement in a, in a certain sense. But the drone revolution will happen primarily in the uncontrolled airspace or currently uncontrolled airspace. And uh, I'm sure this is uh, true in uh, so, some level in all countries uh, right now. Uh, the expectations placed on the drones by the society are, are such that they will override the needs of uh, marginal activities such as GA is understood by the greater society. Uh, and uh, just want to clarify the quote that I write over there. That's not mine. <laughs> that's, that's basically the uh, uh, counter argument about uh, the, uh, our existence. And uh, before you say, well, how about the electric general aviation? I refer to the Dominic's excellent uh, presentation about those two 172 Cessnas that uh, uh, even though electrical propulsion will provide uh, hopefully a great future, uh, the uh, time to replace the fleet will be uh, substantial. Well, how should the sharing of the airspace look like in uh, 2030? In my opinion, all airspace users will be able to sense each other's location in real time. And uh, this will provide new opportunities in a dynamic, flexible, and uh, vibrant environment for all. The uh, idea of what the airspace is will hopefully change to meet the, the real needs, not the expected needs uh, of the aviation when everybody knows who everybody is all the time. What steps need to be taken to get there? Well, first of all should be the recognition that uh, there is an ex existential challenge. Uh, I run uh, way too often into the attitude of, well, we were here first. Well, nobody cares. That's the fact. <laughs> uh, and uh, along the recognition is, of course, is uh, our, our awakening uh, becomes uh, doing something about it. And that, that, that has to require getting involved in the process of defining the future of airspace. We cannot uh, consider these issues as a separate entities that the drone people do their stuff and the commercial air transport people do theirs 
and, uh, and uh, GA people do ours, uh, it's, it's a common airspace and there has to be a common solution that works for all. And that, uh, that requires that we will be in the heart of the matter dealing with it, not just uh, writing statements on uh, already done deals later. And through that we will be uh, affecting change. I firmly believe that uh, we need to transition from see and avoid in VFR to sense and avoid for all airspace users. Uh, and I firmly believe that those who cannot make this change will be uh, will be uh, restricted to ever shrinking pieces of airspace where they can operate. But then again, this transition must be enabled by European-wide flexible regulatory paid basis. Uh, as we discussed here yesterday, uh, the aim of EASA, what is what it is trying to achieve, has a wide support, and uh, uh, I firmly believe in it. Uh, what the EASA is doing currently, but the process is way too slow. And of course, that has been recognized, and there's uh, there are things to be done uh, to get it that get that fixed. But there's a lot of work remain to be done about that. And as we've uh, been bringing up, uh, also uh, during the previous day, the change has to be proportional and ec economically feasible for all users. Uh, I'd like to end up in a positive note with my presentation. But unfortunately, this is the best I can do. Like I said, this is an existential challenge. Uh, are we going to be victims of this change? Or one of the victors? The choice might be ours, but it's not completely up to us. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Very interesting perspective of the regulator. And uh, I appreciate that uh, you highlighted the first step in this journey, on this journey, is to acknowledge the challenge. We move on. The next panelist is a local a guy. He comes from uh, the service provision, air navigation service provider, Austro Control, here in uh, Vienna. Bernhard, Sol Bernhard Solner is a uh, air traffic controller at beautiful Vienna Tower. But he's not only there, he's also involved in many ATM planning and procedures uh, for Austro control. On top of that, he's a passionate private pilot and uh, he also uh, works on integration of drones into the controlled airspace here in Austria. And I'm sure he has uh, plenty of uh, interesting th things to share with us. Bernhard, floor is yours. Good morning to everybody. Hopefully you had some minutes or some hours to enjoy in Vienna. Maybe uh, yesterday, the night, or the day before. Maybe you had already the possibility to fly through Austria or fly through Europe. They are beautiful places and if we talk about sharing the airspace, for me, it's only one way. We have to do that together. There's no chance this is my airspace and this is your airspace. We have to do that together. But today, and also if you talk about in 20 years or in the future, there are a lot of challenges. I would like to say challenges and not problems, because if we sit together, if we talk to each other, if we know the needs of the airspace user groups, we can make that. Hopefully also my colleagues from Aero Club and AOPA are saying that I guess in Austria we are doing a quite good job, what that means. On the one hand, we have a lot of possibilities flying in Austria of, uh, in regard to the mountains for gliders. On the other hand, we have big airports, uh, 
Airbus 380s are flying, we have military and so on, like every country has. But if you sit together, if you know the problem of each other, if you know the needs of each other, I guess that's the best way to make it. Also in Austria, as in all Europe, we have a lot of different airspace users with different ideas, with different demands, and it's still the same airspace we are using. Our rules we are using, are they modern enough for the future? As my colleague said, we are still talking, yeah, sea and avoids. We are talking radio communication. What's about data link communication? Is, are the rules today modern enough? My answer is no, not real. Is the airspace we are using, are the ANSPs flexible enough in regards to sharing the airspace? Could there be a possibility to say, okay, there's no need for me today because the wind is going from the other side and we're using this runway, so this part of my controls in you can have it. You can have it for the next 10 hours. You can have it for the next two hours to become more flexible. In Austria, we have a good understanding in creating platforms to talk to each other. The government says, come on, there's a real need. Sit together and find together a solution. Also in Austria, as we are talking about the future, reduce the airspace complexity. That's not good. If you fly through Europe, there is, let's say, EASA basic rule how the airspace has to be raised up. But it's not the same if you fly in Austria, in Germany, in Hungary, in Italy. It's different. It's not really the same. Be open-minded when talking about the flexible use of airspace. In Austria, we did a good job in using a lot of TSAs, segregated airspace for some hours. But we still have to use the mobile phone to call in, the radio to call in. Hi colleague, is there a chance to use this airspace for the next two hours? And I have to say on the mobile phone or on the telephone, yes, that's okay. Is that more than enough for the year 2030? No. There must be possibilities to share information. We are talking about clouds, we are talking about a lot of data we are using, but there must be a possibility to get this information. The airspace is free, you can use it now. We have to transparent this or to deliver this to the aircraft. The technique we are using for that, today we are talking about data link communication, but that's not more than enough. It's 30 seconds and more if we get the okay from the, from the cockpit. Uh, we are now climbing to flight level 330 or something like that. Also, if you talk about this technique for the GA, for using airspaces to become more flexible, there must be a possibility to get also this information to the smallest cockpits via internet, via handy, via whatever the solution could be. What's the steps to become there? For me, there are a lot of steps, but for me, really important is be flexible as possible. It couldn't be that also the NSPs, also the militaries say, good morning at seven o'clock, this is now my airspace for the next 10 hours, and nobody is allowed to fly through this airspace. If the airspace is not needed, be flexible as possible, to give this airspace for the next minutes, for the next hours to the community. But if the airspace is needed due to emergency weather situations, again, there must be a technique to become this information into the cockpit. If we talk about IFA in this airspace, we are talking also in Austria about IFA in airspace G. Is this safe enough? Are there enough information in the cockpits when flying through airspace G through the clouds? And there's another IFA in airspace golf, also following the other rules, but the crash is in the clouds and everything says, they did correct. 
but the crash is in the clouds. So also here, are there possibilities to get information about the other traffic? What's about the flam? What's about the tickers? And so on and so on. If we talk about IFA on not the big airports and the small airports, we have for the time a lot to discuss about uh, can we land on this strip, on this grass strip, on this concrete runway IFA? No, that's not really easy today. What's about the certification of these airports? But IFA and SPSG and land on this small airport, it's a big advantage uh, when we talk about safety because today the VFR pilot more or less have to stay, not more or less, he has to stay in VMC, but if the weather is not real, real good, especially in Austria, he's flying and he's trying to find his way home, but on a perfect IFA approach or departure through Airspace Golf with perfect information and so on and so on, that could be a best, best way for me also what this topic means. Let us not fall into the trap of applying existing rules to current aviation for an entirely new group. I'm talking about drones. Don't make the fall to say he has to apply, see and avoid, what's about the right of way. That's a new part of the family. So be open-minded and find solution also to welcome this new part of the family. And yes, also in Austria, we're doing our best. Hopefully next year we have raised up a good possibility also for drones outside of the visual range. So we're talking about this one, which are flying really, really automatically. And I guess we have to do a good job to be prepared for the future. And together we will make it. Thank you. Bernhard, thank you very much. Uh, interesting uh, perspective, highlighting the challenges and limits of the current system. And I like that you uh, encourage the audience to think out of the box about uh, the integration of drones and how we will coexist in the, the airspace with these new, uh, new users. Uh, the next panelist comes from Germany. Herbert Martin has been involved in airspace matters in Germany for over 30 years. So he has a quite of a legacy of knowledge of how airspace is organized and has been organized and will be organized in Germany. He is a passionate glider pilot involved in a, also a organizing a big gliding contests. He is an IFR commercial pilot and um, so he has perspective of uh, instrument flying. And imagine, he is doing all of that as a voluntary work because his job is actually a manager, manager of planning and uh, engineering company. So, uh, Herbert, please give us your user perspective on sharing the airspace. Thank, thank, thank you, Vlado. Um, the first one, I'm not commercial IFR pilot. I'm, I've, I've, I'm IFR pilot flying um, on a PPL. Uh, but I, so I know also the other side of the table. Um, I'm involved uh, more than 30 years in the organization of airspace in Germany on the side of gliding. I'm organized uh, in the Deutsche Aero Club and now in the Deutschen Segelflugverband. And uh, airspace is one of the topics point uh, in our work because without airspace, uh, no sports, no gliding in the air. And uh, before I start uh, uh, to the three questions uh, of, uh, made by our leader and the panelists, um, I, I would like to remember everybody who fly with wings. Um, yesterday we saw uh, the time is changing. You can fly without wings. Uh, you fly with uh, copters in any configuration and uh, with uh, a lot of electronical devices on board for steering all this. Don't forget um, that flying began with the exploration and the mastery of the silent flight by Otto Lilienthal. It was in 1889, so around about uh, 119 years ago. 
and not so far away. But we are looking with a, a very complex uh, approach uh, in the next 12 years to 2030. So um, we are also a cultural part of, of flying, I would like to say. And uh, if you remember the first slide, you saw, thank you, Vlado, three pictures for gliders uh, on the slide. Um, that is a cultural part. <laughs> Um, I will start the uh, um, three biggest problems, um, very conservative. Um, we know and we see that the commercial air traffic is taking up more and more airspace. And uh, the approach of the commercial air traffic is that we are the first, we need all the airspace, we have to save every flight by rules and uh, controlled airspaces. And that makes it not easier for the general aviation and especially for the different kinds of air sports and especially gliding. Um, and especially the low cost areas are using new locations, each requiring new protected airspace. In any case, they need a new protected airspace. In Germany, we create for this during the last 10, around about 10 years. Uh, the transponder mandatory zone, and since two years, including listen it, uh, including listen it, listening watch. <coughs> Sorry for my voice. <coughs> Somebody lost his influenza yesterday. I found it. You can get it back at any time. <coughs> um, we thought about the low cost carrier. Um, they are also normally um, part of the business, um, thank you, Lado, um, especially for the um, commercial side of uh, using airspace. But what, uh, why we are not thinking uh, about um, using airspace by air traffic, uh, by, sorry, by, uh, by um, uh, CLT uh, users, um, if they use an, air, an airport, they have to pay tax for using airports uh, and put it on the passenger fee. Why we are not thinking about a tax using controlled airspace by cubic meters uh, per flight or whatever. Uh, it is also a way to uh, make a regulation and uh, make it offer uh, to think about these points. And the, from the side of gliding especially, uh, Bernard, um, you say everything what's our position, thank you very much. Um, you will be a honored member in our community. Um, and he said it not only for Austria, he said it for the whole European situation. And we have the same situation in Germany. Um, but the commercial air traffic, and it means airline traffic, um, take up more and more airspaces. And increasingly, Mixed traffic in airspace E, uh, Echo, or Golf raises special challenges for all other airspace users. That is a big discussion just um, during this time uh, in Germany. We created by the German national regulator uh, so-called Initiative Airspace and Flight Safety. And um, it going back to an um, activity of the uh, German accident uh, organization accident, um, BFU is a, is a German name, sorry, I forget the translation. And uh, they required two points. Uh, one point is every, every user of the airspace need to use and transponder mode S. And the second is every commercial air traffic must be flight in controlled um, airspaces. And uh, if you think this both points to the end, we will get a lot of problems in the airspace. And that is the reason that we are working together with different other organizations from the general aviation, like uh, our OPA, um, Microlight organization, and so on, in this uh, initiative, and looking what will be the best way um, for the mixed traffic in airspace, echo and golf, we are in the present situation of the three biggest problems. And the uh, third point to this, point, uh, to this uh, first question is 
the existing flight guidance systems are not suitable for serving all users to the same standard. Everybody knows it. In other words, no one is able to provide a system for all users. And we are happy for you in the general aviation, uh, sorry, in the general aviation roadmap group. Dominic, it is one of your uh, topic points uh, when you are presented. And uh, we understand it also as one uh, of the topping points in our work. Yes, don't forget, uh, we will be in any, uh, in any time a full aviation partner. Um, but we are looking from the glider side uh, with new aspects and technology, also batteries and electrical engines, using of meteorology and strategy of flying without an engine. But um, for 2030, um, our first thesis is the use of the airspace is becoming more diverse and therefore more demanding. The sharing of airspace by the different users requires everything what Bernard said. I don't uh, want to um, uh, double it. Uh, common desire and attention, mutual understanding and openness to each other, better cooperation and communication in the development of solutions, European solutions based on best national practice that can be used elsewhere in the world. Uh, in different European states, uh, we find a lot of different um, routes from where uh, the airspace organization would be done and uh, um, best neighbors, Germany and France, for example, they have a completely different philosophy to, to organize and, uh, and manage uh, the airspace. Um, Dominic, I would like to say it from my view, uh, the military organizations of airspace using in France has a much more higher um, position, um, like in Germany, for example. And in Germany, we have also, what Bernard told, uh, in Charlie airspaces, yet since 15 years, uh, public using usable uh, gliding sectors uh, managed by an uh, airport um, inside or under the Charlie airspace and in the time when the runway direction is east or west or forever, on the other side, this public gliding sectors are opening um, unlimited for the time when the runway on this side is not used or not in use. And um, it is a very practical uh, organization that um, the controller or the radar, uh, however, gives the information, now we use this airspace, and uh, during the next 10 minutes, all the users, all the pilots in the public glider sector has to leave the sector, and the operating will be start like in a Charlie airspace. That is an example everybody of all other glider uh, um, nations uh, talk to us, oh, it's a wonderful organization, why not in our country? And uh, we did it as a result of a good cooperation between the um, air traffic management organization in Germany uh, and also with the regulators. Uh, it is a normal procedure. Uh, in 2030, we will have much more digital and smart solutions in flight guidance and aircraft controls. We heard it yesterday. Um, and I say again, much more. Um, uh, yes, uh, sorry, I, 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 I find, uh, I, I saw the, uh, the picture over. Um, uh, our systems, um, on ground uh, will communicate directly with each other. I hurry up. Um, we need uh, extremely good cooperation uh, between every partners uh, to uh, bring the ideas from the one side to the other uh, for all users in the airspace. Uh, we need uh, close cooperation and the exchange of ideas from, uh, for uh, all users of the airspace. I'm hurry up. We
we urgently need close cooperation. Uh, no, uh, um, uh, the, the, the point, uh, the underpoint, are uh, the important point. Um, I'm asking for a uniform reporting system for flight events. I think we will have also, with a lot of automatic systems, we will have a failure will be done, and uh, we, we need a an, uh, an, an reporting system for flight event. Also, for these configurations, for the completely automatic, uh, in any case, free of any accidents, uh, uh, expired situation. Um, but my uh, vision said me, as long ATC services are offered for airline traffic, this must be protected. That must be protected also in a very closed airspace, not uh, in the dimension like today, but it must be protected. Some words about Flam. Bernard uh, saw it, uh, did it. Thank you, uh, Bernard. The linking technologies beyond existing user boundaries will be necessary. Um, and that is it. Uh, I make one back because it is your hand to do it, to introduce the rope. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Herbert. Uh, a lot of complexity, a lot of challenges in there and uh, a need for uh, looking for innovative solutions uh, in short term and also in long term. Thank you very much for the user input. The next panelist is uh, coming from UK, Rob Hart. He's uh, working at Skydemon. Skydemon is a company, a small company, producing a software which helps uh, VFR pilots to navigate through the challenges of the airspace. And uh, uh, about Rob, he's not uh, an aviator, uh, active uh, practicing aviator. He's not a pilot, but he's uh, involved with the grassroots pilots for quite some time, and he can provide us uh, some good input, especially on how the data should be managed in the future in order to, to be able to have the, right, the same data on the ground and in the cockpit in real time. <coughs> Rob, floor is yours. Okay, hello. So yes, um, the lens through which I view aviation is perhaps a little unique. Uh, I'm always looking from the perspective of the data that is creating the airspace, um, describing obstructions, uh, all the things that a pilot needs to know when he's briefing himself and when he's in the air. And to some extent, I'm here to make a safety case for um, better integrity of that data, more robust data, less ambiguity in that data. And the angle that I'm coming from here is one relating to confidence. Confidence is the main currency of the world. And at the end of the day, when it comes to sharing airspace, confidence means that each airspace user is confident that all the other airspace users are seeing the same picture. Of course, all different airspace users will be focusing on a different part of that picture, but crucially, the picture as a whole should be the same for all airspace users. Um, at the moment, there are a number of problems, or should I say challenges, um, and I think that Perhaps these elements are not discussed or looked at very much um, uh, from a top-down perspective. These are problems that are seen by regular pilots. So let's have a look at some of these problems. Um, here is an interesting problem. We have four, four coordinates, four pairs of coordinates, and by adjusting the order of these coordinates, you get an interesting and obvious problem. Um, this is fortunately something we see less and less now, but it still does come up occasionally where simply by not paying attention to which order coordinates are presented in, 
you know, you uh, have a computer, takes these coordinates, automatically draws them into some mapping system, doesn't matter if it's SkyDemon or something else, um, the computer doesn't know how to make a decision. It doesn't know um, how to look at this and see any kind of problem. And essentially, this kind of problem requires a human interaction to resolve. Um, we build a tool to flag these items up to us automatically. Um, so that's great for us. Um, but you know, there are many other software products out there um, who may resolve this in a different way and gain a different result, which then presents a different picture to the end user. Here's an interesting problem with ambiguity. When you're describing some airspace which runs from point one to point two to point three to point four and then along the coastline back to point one, you'd be surprised to see how many times in aeronautical data there is no mention of whether this turn is a left-hand turn or a right-hand turn. Now, if you're a human, you can take a look at the associated chart and make the decision and look at it. But hey, we're looking at a future where technology will be looking to do these things fast, automatically, um, and the computer cannot refer to a separate chart document or if it can, it would be a very complex algorithm that would require a lot of investment. And actually, it would be so much simpler if when you're defining this airspace data, you just say, make a left or right or a clockwise or anti-clockwise turn and remove ambiguity completely so that the computer can then just draw what it is given. Another interesting problem arises when airspace or any kind of aeronautical data is created with reference to things on the ground. Here we have uh, an image uh, at the top here. I've created a little bit of airspace following along the coastline of the Isle of Man. Now, you can see in the lower image where I have deliberately used the lowest resolution data possible to make this problem as obvious as possible. But you can see that as soon as you change the resolution of the underlying terrain data, the airspace, if we followed the new res low resolution, would be completely different shape. And this is um, a problem even now, um, you know, we see airspace created with reference to following along a river or along a bridge. And then when we speak to the authority to say, where exactly is this river in absolute terms? They say, look at the chart. But of course, a computer cannot do this. And if we're looking at um, kind of future proofing, the way we um, handle aeronautical data, um, we are going to either need to make underlying terrain data part of the AIP where, you know, uh, AIMs turn around and say, okay, you know, we are telling you exactly what resolution terrain data to use. Here is exactly where the rivers are. I don't think we're going to do that because that's putting even more burden on stretch services. Limited resources are always a problem. Just use absolute coordinates when defining airspace. It really is that simple, and it's really easy to do. Um, you know, we're in 2018, going into 2019, graphical tools where you can easily pick out coordinates relating to rough ground points is enough. So yeah, um, we've got some uh, bullet points there, but I'll just let you read those and, and we'll skip past them. But yes, if I could make some takeaway point here, it's always best to use absolute coordinates instead of referencing ground features. Computers know absolute coordinates. We're all using the same coordinate mapping system. So, lack of confidence. Um, when an, when an airspace user sees that some aeronautical data is defined ambiguously or the interpretation is, um, is potentially weak or poor, that shakes his confidence in the system. And we, you know, uh, in panel one yesterday, we were talking, uh, I have some notes here. Um, 
somebody mentions the, the phrase, too many rules, get to the point where pilots couldn't care less. Every time a pilot sees a poorly created NOTAM, it shakes his confidence in the underlying system. He stops paying attention to the NOTAMs. Every time he sees that some airspace has been defined poorly or when there's gaps in it that, that you know, it's unclear whether he is in or out of the airspace, it shakes his confidence in the system. So, moving forwards, I think uh, I don't need to um, you know, go into where we'll be in the future. We all know that uh, fast data flow using the latest technology, uh, automated decision making uh, where appropriate is, is coming. But how do we get from the current state where, um, where we have these ambiguity or interpretive problems? It's collaborative decision making. And this echoes pretty much everything I've been hearing at the, uh, the safety conference here. Communicating with one another. Um, you know, we have uh, uh, AIMs who um, now contact us. They say, here's some airspace that we have decided to create. Here is our proposed um, uh, coordinate sets for it. Can you please just put it in your tools so that we can see what it will look like to the end user? And then if there is a problem, it can be resolved before publication, not uh, after the user has already seen the mistake and had his confidence shaken. I could talk for literally hours on this topic. Um, and uh, I have more notes here, but I think I should probably leave it there because I've gone over time. So thank you for listening, and uh, I hope it's been interesting. Interesting perspective, interesting, and uh, uh, I like the, uh, the debate, I like the cooperation and collaboration with the stakeholders. Where we need to go, quality, confidence in data, yeah, that's the future, otherwise we fail. So, the last panelist uh, uh, comes from uh, um, uh, uh, Handy Flight. Uh, uh, Guillaume Ferral uh, is uh, going to, he, to give his user perspective and a vision on uh, sharing the airspace. Uh, Almost everything has been done on the um, on the situation on the, what are the three biggest uh, problems related to sharing the the airspace, and uh, I will not be too long on that. Um, at the moment, we can see that um, sharing the airspace is already a big issue when it comes to uh, speaking together. Um, when you have to put around the table uh, GA users, uh, airliners, and um, defense and security mission uh, responsibles, um, it is very difficult. And uh, obviously, we, it's always a bargain. It looks like uh, the GA is not in, in its strong position when it comes to uh, talking together and, uh, and, and sharing the, the airspace. So um, we have to keep on speaking and keep on organizing the uh, coexistence of the, of the, GA, uh, of the airspace uh, and, and uh, with, with the needs of each user. This is not so easy. Um, we always have to consider all this under an environmental uh, angle because you were talking about um, airfields that slowly disappear uh, more and more and um, and this is well the the, the, the way to uh, close an air, uh, an airfield is not only uh, because of urban expansion. It's also because people are getting more and more concerned about environment. And environment is not only uh, the, 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 the fuel burnt, but also the noise. And, uh, people are getting very uh, nervous about the noise. They don't care much about their neighbor uh, cutting the edge. 
but they care much about an aircraft that, that's passing in a, in a very short period of time. Um, you do. <laughs> okay, in 2030, uh, what will it look like? It will lo look like exactly uh, not what I say and not what we think it will be. <laughs> the picture will, uh, if, we, if we monitor what, uh, what we're seeing today, maybe we will have a lot of fun if we're still alive <laughs> in, in, um, in, in 10 or, or 20 years. But anyway, um, the question is, will we still be so many to share uh, the, the airspace? You showed a picture. I saw one picture mis missing. Uh, it should have been a picture of a windmill, a windmill power plant. We've seen in France uh, twin engine aircraft that saw his, both his uh, wings chopped in a question of a uh, few seconds. Well, uh, finally the aircraft could make it and could land, but he landed minus uh, 30 centimeters on one side and, uh, and uh, uh, almost one meter on the other side. Uh, well, maybe he was not exactly in the good uh, and, and the, uh, he was not really abiding to the, to, to, to the altitude uh, regulation, but anyway. Uh, I think the, if we do a projection of uh, what's the situation today and we just increase the number of the users, all in all airliners, defense and, and, uh, and security, and uh, GA and drones, which will be uh, a, a big challenge, of course, then we, will, we have no choice. If, uh, if we want this picture, we need technology. And we need a technology that allows all the users to speak to each other and to uh, know, as you said, Rob, uh, ever a confident uh, a picture that that brings confidence to what is a, am I safe or not, and do I know where the other users are in the airspace I'm I'm uh, I'm using at the moment? Uh, <clears throat> what are the steps? Well, I like uh, André Borchberg's approach of step by step. I think. Uh, we, we haven't been able to imagine uh, really new things, something that doesn't exist. So, well, uh, we have the technology. The technology we have at the moment is able to provide the picture you were uh, thinking of, Rob. So, a confident situation where even VHF is not needed, but to um, reach this uh, reach this situation, we have the step-by-step -step approach. And you can imagine, for example, um, you have transponder mode S, and the moment you take you you contact the tower, the the tower tells before even tell, giving you the, um, the the transponder code, uh, the tower says radar identified. So, what's the point in talking? Why not uh, apply what's, doing, wh what's being done, for example, when you arrive in Oshkosh for the adventure, and you don't speak, you just listen, and at one point, the controller will call you and will say, are you uh, Delta, Echo, November, Charlie, whatever? Uh, you just say, yes, agreed. And that's it. And then you proceed. You don't need to. You are uh, identified. Everybody knows on the ground and around who you are and where you are. And I think uh, the steps that will need to be taken between now and in 30 years will be to be very, very aware of the environmental issues, because 
if we, GA users, airliners and defense and so on, are not uh, taking into consideration all these aspects, then we know we are in danger. We will not be able to um, draw the picture we're thinking of unless we, we are very much uh, concerned about environment uh, problems. That's it. Thank you very much for bringing this uh, um, important environmental perspective into the discussion because that may and probably will influence uh, the way the airspace is organized in the future. We see some big challenges around big airports because of the noise already. All right, so uh, I think there is a uh, uh, time for, for the flow, for the f uh, to, give, uh, to give time uh, for you, for the audience, to, to ask the questions. And uh, uh, what I suggest is that we will first take some questions from Slido. I haven't seen them yet, so I would need to read them first. Uh, we will dedicate some time for Slido questions, but there, towards the end, uh, there will be also opportunity to ask a question on the mic. So. Those of you who are not uh, happy with the gadgets or not a fan of gadgets, then you can ask the question in a uh, typical and traditional way. Okay, what's on the top? When is EASA planning an ADSB mandate like FAA for all aircraft? Oh. <laughs> I think the, I take the, the, the freedom to, to initiate answer on this question, and I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a valid point, but what we have heard, one technology may not serve all the user in the same way. We have to look at the things uh, differently, and uh, we, we may respect the global mandates, but we need to adapt uh, and use whatever is available in a cost-efficient way. Is the ADSB the cost-efficient way? If some areas, definitely yes. In some other areas, if we talk about every airspace user using the airspace, it may not be. So, something like ADSB could be a solution, but uh, uh, I'm not aware of any mandate uh, of uh, EASA for all airspace users to use the ACSB for the moment. And it's a political discussion at the moment as well. All right, so the next, let's take the new, new one, uh, unless the colleagues want to, no? Okay. Oh, why not? If we talk about flexible use of airspace and we're talking about airspace echo, they are flying the Airspace 320 with 250 knots, and there's also flying the glider with not 250 knots. For the time, there's no kind of information between these two aircraft, and they are allowed to fly in the exact same position. We have to have any kind of information for those both people flying this and that aircraft, and for the 200 people sitting in, in, uh, behind the, the pilot of the Airbus 320. I do not say transponder is the best thing. I do not say ADSB is the best thing, but we need something. Thank you, Bernard. And I think this, this view is shared in the, in the, uh, in the, in, in the room. Um, the next question is from Colin. The challenges in airspace access are global. What is happening at the ICAO level? Are current AG classifications fit for the purpose in the future? All right, so the ICAO is a global organization. ICAO needs to fit, uh, fit all parts of the world. Um, uh, some parts of the world are more advanced uh, than uh, ICAO standards. Uh, we have discussed the limitations during the input of panelists. What do you think, guys, uh, about the uh, way of conventional uh, uh, ICAO organization and uh, innovative uh, ways of doing things? Hope. Well, I think, uh, you know, I won't talk about what's happening at the ICAO level. I think that um, A to G classifications are fit for purpose generally, but that we will constantly be inventing new smaller kinds of airspace, you know, radio mandatory zones, transponder mandatory zones, these kind of extra little special bits of airspace that each nation will create as is appropriate for that nation. So, yes, it's fit for purpose, and I think it will always be. There will always be that framework. Um, but, you know, that, that doesn't preclude the possibility of more things. Thank you. 
Yeah, Bernhard. For me, it's a little bit different because, yes, however the name is of the classification, that doesn't matter. But the rules we have to follow in this classification, I guess that's not modern enough because if we're talking about airspace delta and going into a control zone, there's still the regulation that the air traffic controller has to identify this one and it's a clear sentence how to identify an aircraft. And there's real clear that all aircraft going into airspace delta has to have a clearance by air traffic controller. So I appreciate this uh, one we're doing also in Friedrichshafen and there's the aero, yeah? We are responsible as Austro control also for Friedrichshafen. Uh, not yet anymore, but we did last year. Uh, but the rules we have to follow, they are not modern enough, no. Okay. So interesting perspectives, uh, yeah. But I, I think you are sharing one view, that the adjustments would need to be necessary, that uh, both at ICAO and also the uh, regional applications. So. Again, if we talk, sorry for that, we talk about drones and airspace G or uh, 150 meters. A drone is an aircraft. He has to follow uh, minimum flight altitudes. What's about uh, communication? What's about uh, clearances? What about and so on and so on? Thank That's you. not fit for the future, no. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There, has been, there are interesting developments in Europe in uh, airspace architecture, and let's hope for a good results. Okay. Yani. Yeah, well, um, ICAO, of course, has to be part of any solution at least to be, uh, make it, uh, that it can be enabled, uh, that it won't be a hindrance. But uh, ICAO and fast acting is not a sentence that really rings true to me. So uh, those who have the desire must lead, and uh, I hope it's going to be Europe. Yeah. Thank you. Herbert? Um, yes, one point from my side. I agree with um, Rob's um, talking about uh, RMC and TMC. And for example, there we have a regulation problem. Uh, TMC is a very flexible airspace, uh, but uh, since two years we have a listening watch and uh, that is in conflict with Sierra. And uh, I think there will be a good way, uh, it will be a good way to make a um, regulation for that. And uh, listening watch is recommended, but not mandatory. And from the German uh, traffic controls, we heard um, we need a mandatory uh, in the uh, listening watch. Uh, so then it will be finished as a perfect flexible airspace, not only for Germany, for the whole European um, uh, Union uh, countries. It's a lot of working. We, we are looking for the old Article 14 in the basic rule, and I think the new is 70 or 71. Uh, to make a national uh, regulation for this, but it is not the best way. I, I, I can only agree with the way with what you said with your last sentence that national uh, in airspace is not the way forward. It should be inspirational, and I think we should look for European solutions there. And if something is, is good and working well in one country, uh, there are no uh, reasons why it shouldn't be uh, working well in another, another country. Thank you for answering this uh, uh, global question. Um, let's take another one. Uh, Diego asking, should, shouldn't be ta talking about present instead of future? There is still no standardization in airspace organization for VFR flights across Europe. Uh, who picks up this one? Rob. I, I love this question. Um, <laughs> so, yes, you're absolutely right. We should be talking about the present. At the end of the day, the future <laughs> is, you know, it's just the present tomorrow. Um, and we have to get there, and we get there step by step. And this is done effectively, you know, by working together. Every day we work together and we make a little improvement that adds up to a lot over time. Um, we collaborate. We remain open to new possibilities, and we remain open to the possibility that the way we're doing it right now might not be perfect. You know? and, uh, and yeah, there's still no standardization in airspace. I absolutely agree. And we can do something about that, you know? And that doesn't have to come from top-down, you know, mandating of a particular way of doing things. Um, by collaborating with our neighbors and collaborating with 
you know, um, other airspace users and um, visualizers of data and guys who are using this data in new and interesting ways. Um, we can arrive at standardization naturally and in a way that doesn't make anyone feel that they're being squashed into a box. Yeah, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you for interesting input. Okay, let's take the and another one uh, from Julian. Will regulators allow GA to take advantage of high volume, cheap technologies emerging for drones without losing the net safety benefit by certification burden? Dominic, would you like to answer that one? <laughs> I think it's. <laughs> Well, the, the will is not appropriate in the question eh, because we already do it. Eh? Yep. So uh, it was presented yesterday via the CS TAN. It's possible today to install a flarm, for example, on your airplane. There is no burden. There is no, you don't lose no safety benefit. It's there. We promote the installation of flarm for those pilots flying in area where there is a, a, a large concentration of gliders, for example. So you are invited to mitigate the risk you are taking flying in such area by equipping your aircraft with flam. It's just common sense. Um, again, CSTAN in Revision 3, currently under consultation, we are uh, proposing the installation of a cheap ADSB uh, device and in coordination with NSP, Eurocontrol, and we are working together to start to to, to promote also the use of this kind of uh, uh, system, a conspicuity device, which could be uh, interesting in, in some specific configuration. You can install Rosetta pilot aware system on board your aircraft. There are very interesting experiments in the UK actually. I, I, I'm passionate by what pilot aware is doing actually, especially in the context of getting a bearing distance from transponder mode S broadcast around around yourself. So it is there, it's not the future, uh, as Rob was mentioning, it is there, it's possible, there is no certification burden, and for 250 pounds or 280 euro, you can get the device and there is no certification burden. Thank you, Dominic, for providing input on behalf of EASA like Bernhard. Thank you for this, but if you're entering airspace Delta or Charlie with this drone, what has the air traffic controller do? Providing separation, doing communication with this one? The question was not about drone okay. penetrating an airspace. The question was GA, GA user taking advantage of drone technology. Okay, sorry for that, yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, there are many challenges outside control. Yes, but you are, you are yes, just, just one word. Uh, you are right, Dominic. There, there are so many ways, like FLAM. The, the issue is. Um, uh, Shall we ask everybody to adhere to the idea of having a, a flam or whatever the same uh, same kind of device for provides the same? Uh, the thing is, um, you if you do not uh, say it is compulsory, then there will still be holes in the web. And um, when when you look at the flam, it's been widespread in France everywhere but only for uh, gliders. Uh, as long as uh, re recreational aviation, uh, air clubs and so on are concerned, very few aircraft in air clubs are equipped with, uh, with FLAM. So uh, uh, the point is, uh, uh, do we have to uh, make it compulsory? I think the answer is yes. In <laughs> Dominic? I told you before, it's my favorite topic. Eh? <laughs> we have more than 20,000 users of FLAM. FLAM has been designed to address the specific risk of mid-air collision between gliders. So in, in, in the way the software was coded, the risk they, were, they wanted to address was the risk of glider mid-air collision. Eh? We, we should remember that. And we, we had no mandate, and the success is there. People, all glider pilots are using FLAM. Personally, I'm not in favor of mandating. We, we need to come, and I, I, I invite the, 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 the OEM, I invite the companies like uh, Skydam and Pilot Aware, Flam, and we talk together to come with solutions that will be so attractive 
that without any mandate, people will select the product and install the product on board the aircraft. And again, with a FLARM, you will not mitigate the risk of mid-air collision with a Boeing 737 of Ryanair. It's not the purpose. You are not addressing this risk. So we need to educate the community to understand what, what is the risk that they want to mitigate in order to select the proper product. In many cases, transponder mod S could be the best solution. And now we come with solution where we can integrate the data provided by the different system, conspicuity device, transponder mod S, through grand network like the OGN. And I'm observing this very closely because I believe this is the future. If the, the NSP, if the nation are not capable to, to deploy an ADSB ground network for us, the small business like uh, Pilot Aware and other with FLAM, with the OGN, they already do it. It is there. It is not future. So please be aware that something is happening and we can take benefit of it. Thank you, Dominic. Yanni? Uh, I think that's a very good question from Julian. And I firmly believe that the solution for GA and, uh, and the future of drone traffic to coexist in un uncontrolled airspace will come from uh, that side. Uh, and uh, as far as mandating or uh, what, uh, I would refer to the success of the GSM. That was a European project that took over the world. And in part of that, uh, the question from Andre Kollar about who should lead the way in creating platform with sense and avoid data will be exchanged. I, I certainly hope that it's going to be Europe because that's going to be a massive possibility for us. Uh, I mentioned uh, that the solution to the sense and avoid has to be pro proportional and economically feasible. And I think that will take uh, the obvious solution that it will have to come from the telecommunications world, uh, not, not necessarily from the traditional aviation side. Thank you for this very interesting perspective. Thank you, Yanni. Um, there is, uh, I think we, have, uh, we, are, we are very close to the time, so I'll, I'll take the, the last question. The military issue, do, not, do you expect a common guide for all Europe about the military use of their reserved airspace? And I, I think we, we have it already. No. No. <laughs> but we have uh, TSAs, TRAs, restricted areas. I think we have it, but not uh, the way it's applied varies across Europe. That's true. As uh, my eastern part of uh, Europe, we have different challenges, so there's going to be different solutions. Okay. Any other input on this question? Not the same. Okay, so let's take Andre's uh, question. Who should lead the way in creating a platform where sense and avoid data will be exchanged? The market. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, we, we briefly touched on this uh, question just now. And uh, yeah, the simple fact is, is that there are lots of interesting technologies coming out. Pilot Aware has been mentioned several times. Uh, an amazing little project that's really lit a fire underneath Sense and Avoid. Um, you know, it, it's incredible. Um, it may not be the future. But what it's doing is it's creating the conversation and it's leading the conversation and driving it. And if new technologies then emerge afterwards, brilliant. I personally believe ADSB is going to be, you know, the future. Um, there are so many possibilities that we're doing in the UK, um, using ADSB to transmit UAT weather uh, up to the aircraft without relying on telecom systems at all. Um, you know, that's a great trial that's showing a lot of promise. Um, and, uh, and yeah, at the end of the day, this is being done by, you know, individual businesses who are just getting on with it, you know whether it's uh, us or Pilot Aware or, or you know, the FLAM initiative, uh, however many years ago, um, the market is just doing it. And, and I suppose the concern is that, um, you know, if we sit around talking about it, then we'll all be left behind. So, yeah. Herbert? Yes, <clears throat> uh, Dominic, I agree uh, with your position about FLAM. Um, a, a small correction. 
24,000 flam are installed in Europe now. Uh, I got the uh, figure from, from Andre. But um, the advantage to use the uh, information uh, will be much more uh, bigger when we send it on, when we bring it on a, a database. And uh, it is a um, user self organized um, platform called Open Glider Network. And all the FLAM data um, going down to the ground, and we build up a uh, network. And every station on ground needs around about 100 euros. It is a small um, electronic device and put it uh, to a connecting to the, uh, to the internet. And we are in discussion with the German um, air traffic management to bring this information also in the data which are going up uh, to the CDTI uh, in, an, uh, in an, a commercial airliner. And we are also looking to use this data bringing up, including the transponder and ADSB data, also in the glider CDTI. I would like to say it. Everybody fly with a display for navigation, and so we have also the information about the other traffic. And most of the gliders, uh, and we preferred it, uh, build in a trans an ADSB in. Uh, um, it's very, very small and cheap um, device. And so we have a completely overview which kind of glider, which kind of tr commercial and which kind of general aviation uh, plane is around us. Uh, so it makes a much more better awareness for everybody. Yeah, thank you, Herbert. It is present. It is not the future. It is present. Thank you, Herbert. This was about the combining the sources into one yes. platform, which could be then shared and used by uh, all the others. Uh, Bernhard. But it would be perfect if this example is going to the regulator for Europe and says, this is a good example, let's do it for whole Europe. Well, on the other hand, and it's my last uh, sentence on this topic, but if you're talking about more than 10 years uh, becoming the correct uh, speech of uh, doing a digital notum, we are working now more than 10 years on this topic and we have not yet found a good solution for that. That's not fast enough. Huh? That's not the time we should use. Thank you for that. <laughs> Limits of the current system. I, I, I can uh, reassure you, Bernhard, that uh, Herbert and uh, uh, those involved in the initiative in Germany are uh, talking to EASA, and EASA is uh, actively promoting and uh, encouraging dialogue on this topic, and we will continue to do so, because we see a potential in that, not for uh, airspace users only, but uh, also for the ground services that could benefit out of it, uh, and eventually the airlines. Um, I will stop the Slido discussion for the moment, and uh, I will ask uh, uh, the audience to, to ask questions on the mic. Is, is there anyone interested? Uh, excuse me, give a little moment to you. Sorry, I'm just a... Well, quick last word on this one. Uh, uh, I think uh, we should leave the, mar uh, the uh, standardization. I think it should be the regulators and the market together. Yes. And, uh, and uh, because in that way we can provide a stable platform where the market can innovate. And, uh, and that's what I feel that uh, in the EASA process we've been very strongly doing things together with the, with the market. Thank you, Annie. And now the question. October 23, I flew from Philadelphia over Baltimore to Washington, D.C. In, in a Bonanza. We had ADS-B in, and Tower said to us, we are descending from 6,500 to 3,500 feet. He said, there is one aircraft at 2 o'clock. We don't talk to him. Approximately 500 feet below you. It scared the hell out of us. Because we saw all the other ones, but we didn't see that one. And that's the only one, the one that you don't see, that is scaring you. I don't care about the other things that I see because I see them. And there's a second point. We use a system called Xavion. Xavion showed also wake turbulence of big aircraft. And there was a 787 flying in front of us. And you saw this big wake trail on your ADS-B screen. And that helped us because we asked to level off and let the thing go down instead of going through the wake. 
And on a small bonanza, if you go through a 787 wake, you do aerobatics. Thank you. Thank you. Very two, uh, good, uh, two interesting points and uh, highlighting the potential of the technology for safety without uh, actual mandating uh, things. But we can all agree that in terms of visibility, and that was, I think, shared across the podium here, uh, we need to have a, a sense of where the airspace users are flying in the future. That's inevitable. Uh, any other question from the floor? Yes, in the back. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to underline what was just said. You know, the not seen things are the things which scare us most. I agree fully. And uh, what I don't hear is in this discussion anything talking about non cooperative targets that is. In my opinion, the greatest challenge right now, also with the drones, because they are all non-cooperative, and using the airspace is subject to rules. That is another thing which is not in the civilization right now, and I want to know how this is addressed by the regulator. Yanni. Yeah, uh, kind of was alluding that into my uh, presentation that. Uh, uh, in the short term, those non-cooperative uh, uh, drones or whatever, they will be granted an airspace where they can be by themselves, taking the airspace away from us. And uh, that airspace is going to get bigger and bigger uh, unless we get into the sense of void for all users of that airspace. And uh, one way or another, we have to get there or we will be choked out of existence. Thank you. Thank you for answering. Any other questions from the floor? I don't see any. We have still a little bit of time. So I, I think we can pick up uh, Slido questions again. There is a question from Martin uh, on better management of airspaces required. GN needs low-cost portable CNS solutions. Where do you think 5G technology fits into the future CNS environment? Panelists. Yes, it will become. Robert? Yes, it will become, absolutely. I can tell you about um, an example in, I'm from Germany, so I have only examples from Germany, or mostly. Um, there's a project between the German telecom and um, the air traffic management. Um, it started from the management of drones, but uh, now we are, or they are, in the discussion about this to use uh, uh, LTE 5 uh, as a basic technology for the, in the next 10 plus years. Thank you, Herbert. Yanni? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, like I said earlier, I think this has to be the solution. The uh, telecommunications have the volumes get the, uh, uh, the prices and the ranges that are, are fit for us. And uh, I, I hope that we will have a real-time airspace that, for example, when now we have a block of airspace reserved for this operation, why couldn't that block be a lot smaller and follow that airspace user while it flies? And uh, when it's not using the airspace, it's going to be fear free for all. The current system is uh, uh, very inflexible in that sense, and uh, technology and the real-time awareness of where everybody is would enable a vastly more efficient use of airspace. Thank you, Annie. Bernhard? Yeah, also, from my part of view, a clear yes. In Austria, we are looking for the correct adapter, how to go into our system. But for me, it's not real clear if it must be 5G or something like that. So, also in Austria, we have... Uh, good cooperation uh, with the technique uh, company, and they're showing us the problems when using the normal uh, handy uh, 4G system for the time, or LTE. Maybe there must be something special, but in direction 5G here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bernhard. I will just compliment what colleagues said, that uh, there are public information that telecom companies are offering high-speed internet in a, in a commercial jets for 200 passengers, so there, 
there is no technical reason why this shouldn't be uh, possible uh, in future for GA. And yesterday, some of the panelists were sh saying, uh, actually, I'm all the time connected when I'm flying. So, and I'm, I'm seeing through the internet all traffic around me. So I think this is the way where, where this uh, will go in the future. Let's take the next one as the last one. Uh, question from Peter. Improving safety in shared airspace. How do we get more valid accident incident reports with an in-depth root cause analysis? Analysis. Analysis. Very interesting question because then it comes to how we monitor the safety and how uh, we learn from this and what improvements, what actions we put in place. Guys, anyone interested in? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll have a go. So, um, at the end of the day, one of the things that we found is um, to gain a greater engagement with airspace users, the best thing to do is to make it as easy as possible for them to engage. So, you know, whether that's uh, some easy web access um, that, that, that anyone can use, or maybe a framework that, you know, navigation systems like ourselves could um, automatically detect. You know, if you have a, uh, a collision avoidance box, um, Sky Demon could, you know, I'm not saying we're going to do this, but just theoretically, um, uh, identify when you have come very close to another aircraft. And perhaps when you land, then Sky Demon says, would you like to file an Airprox report? that then takes your log, takes a snapshot of what happened at that time, and just fires it off to the appropriate inbox in whatever authority. Um, you know, uh, technology and, and an improved data flow makes all kinds of things possible. Um, you know, uh, but, but even so, there's another aspect, which is that, okay, you can make it very easy to file such report or to notify the authorities, but unless the airspace user has confidence that the authorities are paying attention, looking at that report prudently and, and, and appropriately, and responding to it appropriately, you know, if, if they don't believe that anything meaningful is going to happen as a result, then they're just not going to do it, no matter how easy you make it. So it's not just about the end user. It's about everybody up the... Uh, uh, analysis chain, um, you know, the, the whole process would need to be streamlined, basically. Thank you. Uh, I think it's now f time for summary of the discussion. May I, have my, may I have the slides back on the screen, please? Thank you. Okay, so, so in terms of uh, challenges, and I'm accommodating uh, Bernhard's proposal, uh, in terms, uh, the, the traffic will increase and it will, it will be more variable. That's uh, what uh, all panelists uh, uh, clearly uh, indicated. There will be a big variety of users, new entrants. We have to uh, think how to live together in the same space. The airspace will be more complex. Uh, it's, uh, the challenge is the availability. We cannot restrict our airspace for exclusive use. We need to think how to collaborate, cooperate, cohabit in the same airspace. Uh, there is the issue of ambiguity, uh, uh, as highlighted by uh, Rob. There is an issue with data quality, reliability, and the techn technology, current technology is a bit obsolete, uh, diverse, not always interoperable and they're sometimes very costly for certain airspace users. And uh, uh, we are more reactive in terms of rea uh, environment than, than proactive. Then, what should be the vision? What we have heard from panelists and also uh, on, in some instances from the audience, there will be higher density at all levels uh, and unmanned traffic will be fully integrated into the airspace then users will be and should be more open and there should be a mutual understanding of the airspace use and uh, collaboration should be all uh, uh, in real time. In terms of airspace, uh, higher freedom and not higher freedom not to be seen but higher freedom to indicate where are you 
so you could use airspace uh, in a better freedom. Then independent, so uh, in choosing the platform and the airspace is independent from uh, airspace users and independent from, it's, it's shared by it all. So everyone has the same right to share the airspace. And uh, there will be advanced deconfliction tools, both uh, in uh, uncontrolled and controlled airspace, and also in the mixed environment. In terms of data, there will, they, they, we need to go for standardized, ultra-fast and reliable data, which are processed in real time into the cockpit, and which are unambiguous, are clear and uh, shared across the platforms. And technology should be tailored to the user, to the needs, so there should be a choice. It should be affordable, scalable, and uh, fully interoperable. And the way how we find it, we, we could be very innovative compared to current environment. And in terms of uh, environment, uh, it should be proactive and continuous consideration. And how should we get, should we get there? In terms of traffic, uh, what I have heard was uh, integration of unmanned and manned was the dominant topic. Then in terms of uh, users, collaborative decision making, intelligence sharing, so they're sharing the data for benefit of all because there is a common benefit at the end. The airspace will have, uh, should have uh, transparent and clear rules with less bureaucracy, I like that very much, and respectful treatment based on trust. Data, automated meshing, processing and collection, and uh, uh, seamless communication throughout the flight, all phases of flight, and supporting safety decisions. The data would need to support safety decisions. Technology, interoperability standards would need to be developed, and uh, if we are moving from uh, see and avoid to sense and avoid. User-driven and cost-efficient, so the users decide what technology is the best for their use, and based on a common platform, and we would need to find that platform. And environment would need to be always considered. I, I conclude here. Thank you very much to my panelists for interesting contribution and active participation and also to the audience. Very interesting questions and very encouraging discussions. Challenge is ahead of us and I'm looking forward to take the challenge. Thank you very much.